Hello and welcome to the On the Couch podcast, the podcast that gives you the view from the therapist chair. I'm your host, John Dennis, a licensed professional counselor. You're listening to OTC episode 40 with Dr. Les Parrott, author of Healthy Me, Healthy Us. We all want healthy relationships. You know, everybody would say that they want to be happy and healthy, whether that's physically or in their their love life with their family and friends. And that's part of what makes today's episode so important is my conversation with Dr. Les Parrott. He talks about his book, Healthy Me, Healthy Us, and the idea that having a healthy, happy relationship starts with us. It starts with the individual paying attention to issues that they might have and and working to improve themselves and get healthy themselves before getting into that relationship. And that doesn't mean that if you're a listener that you're already in a relationship, you're already married and you're you're thinking, well, great, you know, what do I do now? It doesn't mean your relationship is doomed and you should get out of it. You're still able to work on it while you're in the relationship. You're able to improve the relationship by improving yourself and working on yourself. And then your relationship will will see the benefit of that. And the the reason I wanted to talk with Dr. Les Parrott is he and his wife have done – all of the the work. They've done all of the the research and the heavy lifting for us and packaged it in this this book. I wish I could show you my copy of the book because honestly, I could have like highlighted almost everything in it and dog-eared almost every page with something as, you know, this nugget of information that that I wanted to keep for myself or pass on to other people. I, I've already recommended it to so many people in my counseling practice. And I wanted to, to make sure to be able to share that with the listeners. If you're not familiar with Dr. Les and Leslie Parrott, they are number one New York Times bestselling authors uh, multiple times over. Uh, their bestselling books include Love Talk, uh, Crazy Good Sex, and they have an award-winning uh, assessment, the Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts uh, assessment package. And in the episode, we actually talk about the YADA assessment, which is an assessment for an individual to to help them learn about themselves and and learn ways they can improve. And then they have uh, an assessment for couples, uh, Better Love. So if you go to betterlove.com, that's similar to the uh, YADA, but it's for the couple. And in addition to that, I mean, their works have been featured all over the place, uh, New York Times, USA Today, CNN. They've, they've done the morning show circuit with Good Morning America, the Today Show, Oprah. Um, the governor of Oklahoma actually declared them uh, marriage ambassadors, uh, f- first ever statewide marriage ambassadors. Uh, they've been called upon to uh, provide help and support in the aftermath of worldwide disasters like uh, Ground Zero with 9-11 and Chernobyl. Uh, The commander of the 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, actually invited them to assist soldiers with re-entry into family life upon returning from Iraq. So obviously, the, the parrots really know what they're doing. They have a heart for couples and uh, have have made things so accessible, and I, I really hope that you take something from this. So I'm here with the On the Couch podcast. I'm thrilled to have on Dr. Les Parrott, who is a New York Times bestselling author, creator of Symbus, uh, psychologist, relationship expert, and, and a whole lot of other things. So welcome to the show. Thanks, Sean. Good to be with you. Thank you for being able to do this. I really appreciate it. And I know you recently launched your book, Healthy Me, Healthy Us. So that was Tuesday, right? Yeah, it just came out. I opened up the first case of them here just this week, which is always a thrill. My wife, Leslie, and I, and by the way, we have the same first name, so it's a little confusing. (laughs) I'm Leslie and she's Leslie. It's even more complex because my dad's name is also Leslie 
as is my grandfather. So I'm the third, uh-huh. Leslie, and I'm married to Leslie, and that's why we named our first son John. It's a good, strong name, John. I like it. <laughs> yeah. John Leslie is his middle name. And my wife, Leslie, and I, still, you know, we've written a number of books, but it's always thrilling to have a new one come out. And sure. so, yeah, healthy me, healthy us. Now, does it ever get old, the new book? It came out and unpacking the first carton of it? or is it- Absolutely not. It's always a thrill. You work so hard. You pour, you know, usually a, a good year of your life into getting this thing to yeah. place it so ready to go. And so it's always exciting. You work on it. And then another year goes by that the publisher does their thing usually. And so it's like seeing an old friend. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Imagine in the time it takes to get back sometimes. Yeah. Moving on to like other projects sometimes. For sure. We're excited about the next one. But as we've learned, don't talk about the next one until you're ready. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. That's a commitment when you do that. In reading through the book so far, I resonated with so much of it. I mean, just as a a therapist, but, you know, husband, father and human being, that idea of you got to focus on yourself first and make sure you're healthy and that will pay off in all those other relationships. Is that kind of the premise? Yeah, it's a little bit before we were all in lockdown in the midst of a worldwide pandemic and hopping on airplanes, you'd hear a flight attendant say at some point before we even would lift off into the ground, put your own mask on before you help other people, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And it's it's kind of the same uh, sentiment when it comes to relationships. Your relationships can only be as healthy as you are. Therefore, mm-hmm. the most important thing you'll ever do is work on who you are in the context of your relationships. In fact, let me tell you how we got to this, if you don't mind. Yeah. We couldn't have written this book 20 years ago. It's only after doing what we've done for the last 20 years that we can really focus on what we consider the hub of the wheel for relationships. And that's working on yourself. Leslie and I started, we were teaching at a a university here in Seattle and some students asked us, and this is our first year, we just come out of graduate school, moved up from Los Angeles and we're teaching and some students said, hey, would you come over to our residence hall and give a talk on how to fall in love without losing your mind? (laughs) <laughs> and it was around Valentine season. We said, that's an incredible title. Yes, we will do that. I said, how many students do you think that will have show up? They said, well, probably a dozen, but uh, sometimes we have as many as 20. I said, fantastic. What time? It will be on a Thursday night around 10 p.m. All right, we'll be there. And so the floor was going to get together and they put their flyers up on the floor. Well, as we made our way over there, there's a line of students literally coming out of the residence hall for this thing. It was just supposed to be for 20 students. Wow. And uh, at first I thought, wow, I wonder what's happening here. (laughs) And then realized they were all there for that topic. Now, it wasn't for us. They had no idea who we were. We hadn't written a book or anything. We're brand new to the campus. But it was such a salient moment. It, It really became a pivot point in the trajectory of our efforts because we realized how hungry, how thirsty these students are for information on healthy relationships. And so that spring, we thought, let's do something for all the engaged couples on the campus. And so we did a little event, just a local event on our campus called Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts. Again, we were overwhelmed by the number. We did it the next year. It doubled. We did it the next year. It tripled. Now people were literally flying in from around the country to go to this event that we called Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts. So we wrote a book by that title. And lo and behold, uh, Oprah Winfrey calls and Tom Brokaw and Barbara Walters. And suddenly we had this national platform for talking about marriage and relationships. And of course, we're passionate about it. Of course, we train for it, too. We're both psychologists. But then we thought, why in the world... Do we not have a class on a major university campus? Why in the world do we not have a class on relationships, like a relationships 101 class, you know? Because the truth is we teach students everything in the world. You want to learn about accounting? We got a major in that. You want to learn about nursing? Yeah, we got a major in that. You want to learn about psychology? You want to learn about whatever it is, right? We got all that covered. But when it comes to the single most important source of contentment and happiness in our lives, relationships, We don't offer a single course on it, let alone a major. Not even college. I'd say starting elementary school or middle school. (laughs) Right. Yeah. We just don't get trained. Specific way that's dedicated to bringing the research, the best research out there to the forefront and and putting, as we like to say, putting the cookies on the bottom shelf, making it easy for people to get to. So anyway, we thought, let's do a class. We'll call it Relationships 101, a, a real academic course that'll be for any student that wants to 
take it. Well, if you know anything about academic settings, you know you don't just team up a class and start teaching them. You got to get it approved by the provost and the dean and the committees and all that. So we put a proposal together for Relationships 101. We brought it to the committee. They reviewed it. Eventually looked up at us and said, mm, thanks, but no thanks. Oh, wow. We said, why not? Why, why wouldn't you want a course on relationships? They said, well, it's not, uh, doesn't have enough rigor. I said, what do you mean? They said, it doesn't have enough academic rigor. I said, we'll put information in here that confuses the students, if you like. You know. And they said, uh, well, there's not even a textbook for a class like this. I said, we'll write our own if we need to. They said, well, other universities don't have classes like this. I said, maybe they should. Maybe they will. And anyway, they turned us down. And so we left and, and we just it just kept percolating for another couple months. And so we rewrote our proposal, came back to them another time, uh, once more got turned down. We went through this three times until they said, OK, here's the deal. We'll let you teach this class Relationships 101, but only under these conditions. And they list them off. And it was things like it'll need to be a pass fail course so it doesn't impact anybody's GPA. It'll need to be a general elective, so it's not required for anybody's major or graduation. It'll need to be taught as an overload, meaning once other classes have been filled, if you can find a classroom that's empty, you can use that. Oh, wow. Oh, and you'll need to teach it without compensation. Really stacking the deck against you, man. <laughs> exactly. We set off to teach this class, Relationships 101, and, and the only classroom we could find was on a Monday evening around 6 p.m., which is not prime time. And there was 12 chairs in it. We thought, hey, even if we can fill up half of them, we'll be doing well. Well, the first day of registration, the registrar calls my office. He says, Doc, he said, uh, we got to move your classroom. I said, what, you need the space for something else? <laughs> he said, no, you didn't uh, cap the course. And I said, what do you mean? He said, in the computer, you filled out all the information about the course so we could put it in the catalog, but... Uh, you didn't set a cap on it. Yeah, you didn't limit the number of students. I said, uh, oh, why does that matter? He said, 250 students have signed up for the class in the last two hours. Wow. He said, so we have to move you to the auditorium, and there's a waiting list of students that want to get into the class, and we still have three, three or four days of registration to go. That was well over 15 years ago. And we've been teaching that content, that information on Monday nights, 6 p.m. <laughs> for a long time. And we start the class by saying, it doesn't matter to us whether you take any notes. There's no wow. pop quiz. There's no midterm, no final. It's a, you know, it's a pass fail course. You'll get out of it whatever you want to get out. And, and by the way, there's always students that come in. They sit in the aisles because they, they couldn't get in the course. Just auditing. Yep. Yeah. And so I say, at least write down this single sentence, because this sentence that I'm about to give you has the potential to revolutionize every relationship you ever attempt to build. If you can kind of allow this sentence I'm about to give you to sink down into the cortex of your brain and be lived out through your spirit, it has that kind of revolutionary power. To influence your relationship with mom and dad, with your friends, with your siblings, you know, your teammates, your roommate, your potential soulmate and everybody else. And they all get poised with their pencils or the keyboards and they're ready to take down the sentence. And here's the sentence I give them. If you try to build intimacy with another person before you've done the difficult task of getting whole on your own, all your relationships become an attempt to complete yourself. Let me see this again. If you try to build intimacy, if you try to build a connection, if you try to build a relationship with another person, before you've done the difficult task of getting whole, of getting healthy on your own, all your relationships become an attempt to complete yourself and they'll fall flat. Guaranteed. Why? Because nobody was designed to complete you. And we're always mm -hmm. looking for that shortcut. We're always looking for that other person that will do that. But that's how we start it. And that's really the sentiment of this whole book, Healthy Me, Healthy Us. If I had to sum it up in a sentence, it would be that very sentence. By the way, I need to tell you, the last time we taught this class, a student came up to me two weeks later and he said, hey, Dr. Parrott, and I'm, I'm kind of at the podium, you know, I'm putting my slides together and getting plugged in and all that. Uh, all these students are filing in. And it's kind of noisy. And he says, hey, Dr. Parrott, can I talk to you for a second? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm a little distracted, but what's going on? And he said, oh, he said that uh, first night you gave that sentence out. Yeah, yeah. He goes, that was really cool. And I said, oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. He said, no, it was really cool. I said, OK, I get it. Thanks. I really, really appreciate that. He said, no, it meant a lot to me. I said, man, I'm, I'm so grateful that you would take that. And now he has my full attention, right? I've set aside my, my notes and everything, and I'm looking at him. He says, can I show you something? And I said, yeah. He pulls up his T-shirt a little bit, and he shows me that his 
tattooed that sentence on his rib cage on one side. <laughs> Wow. I, I want, dedication. Yeah, I wanted to say, hey, brother, we have a whole lot. We have a whole semester to go. I might say something even better. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, doesn't that speak just volumes about the hunger and thirst that this generation has for information on healthy relationships? And, and that's really part of the catalyst for why we wrote this book, Healthy Me, Healthy Us. As you were talking about it, uh, that's the first sentence that I highlighted and I was going to read out is that trying to build intimacy with another person, you know, before you've gotten whole. Why do you think so few of us know that and understand that? Why does it seem like we are taught to outsource so much? Well, uh, because we grow up with fairy tales and uh, we grow up with novels and movies and, you know, the the most iconic movie uh, really that Mm -hmm. conveys that sentiment, which is a fantastic movie, is Jerry Maguire. Yeah, you complete. Yep. (laughs) And it was uh, truly uh, one of the most quoted movies in all of cinematic history. Show me the money. Right. But every romantic remembers that one line. Right. You complete me. You had me at hello and you complete. Mm-hmm. Me. So we, we buy into that, expecting another person to be kind of a shortcut to personal growth and personal well-being and wholeness. And that's a tall order. You put that on somebody, you start to lean into them for that. Eventually, you're going to start to pound down on them because nobody can deliver. Nobody can do that. Now, we can help each other as iron sharpens iron. We can do that. But but it's nobody's job Mm -hmm. to make up for all the stuff that you're lacking. And that's where we get into trouble in our relationships because we come through a relationship and we feel like a relationship that's fizzled or a relationship where we got burned. And and we think this next person is going to make up for that. They're going to heal me because it's going to work out right. And, well, lo and behold, maybe it wasn't the other person. Maybe it was you, right? I remember Dave Ramsey joked, uh, and it's not much of a joke, but the the idea of like, don't look for the perfect church because you won't find it. You know, it's got people in it. And if you do find it, get away from it because you'll ruin it. <laughs> Same kind of idea. You yes. know, you're not going to find the perfect person and you're not perfect either. So well, yeah. that's exactly right. And Dave's a good friend of mine and we do a lot of speaking around the country together. When I'm on his radio show, inevitably we'll take calls and he'll say something about you don't have a, a money problem. You have a marriage problem, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and then I want to say, you don't have a marriage problem. <laughs> you have a self problem <laughs> because nice. you need to get healthy, right? Emotionally, relationally, spiritually healthy. And so that's why we're just so passionate about this. And, and it's really, like I said, we couldn't have written this book, Healthy Me, Healthy Us, before we really had all the research we have to stand on these days and say it with conviction and with authority. No uh, reputable social scientist is going to disagree with this premise because the research is so uh, significant. Especially now, mental health and relationship, I feel like we're finally coming into our heyday where it's it's being talked about so much more. And I know in the counseling work that I do that I'll try to communicate this very concept of, you know, you can't love and you can't be loved until you're able to love yourself. And otherwise, yeah, you're just going to be trying to find somebody to complete you or, you know, fill in the gaps in whatever way you feel you're deficient and it's not going to work. That idea of getting healthy, you you talk in the book about the, the, you know, kind of the definition of that and the three hallmarks. Yeah, what what should people be looking for as uh, things that they need to get healthy in or, or work on? Yeah, I appreciate the question. What happens, just to close the loop on that uh, last piece there, what happens when we start to pound down on the other person and we expect them to make us whole and we think they're kind of a shortcut is that uh, we, we set ourselves up for repeated failure. So anybody that's looking that's listening to us right now and is going, uh, why do I keep having these relationships that seem to, are are all men this way? Are all women, you know, that that kind of mentality. I I just want to underscore that this is getting to that, the question, this is getting the answer to that question that you're raising. And also for people that are already in a relationship, you know, so many times I get this question about, he won't go to counseling with me or he won't um, do anything that's, that's going to work and help our relationship or she won't or what have you. And a relationship is a little bit like a mobile that hangs down from the ceiling and you change one little piece just slightly and it has to find a new equilibrium, right? Mm-hmm. 
so anybody that's listening to us right now that's thinking, I, I don't feel like I can do this because I need someone else to be doing this with. No, that's not the issue. This is all about you. And if you're single, right, you become the kind of person, and this might sound like hackneyed advice, but it's so true. Uh, instead of looking for the right person, you become the right person, and that person is drawn to you. And so I, I just wanted to kind of put that out there before I answer your question, which I love, uh, and that is, okay, um, enough buildup. What do you do to get healthy? And this was the issue that continually stalked us in so many ways. My friend Neil Warren and I founded this company called eHarmony 20 plus years ago. I, I remember asking Neil one day and, and, and we just couldn't believe how, you know, the, the internet was new and, mm -hmm. and finding the love of your life online was like the Wild West and, and yet this thing still took off eventually. And, and I asked Neil one day, I said, hey, if you could only give one word of advice to uh, a person about to be married, what would it be? And he stopped for like a split second. I mean, it was on the tip of his tongue. He said, get yourself healthy before you get yourself married. Mm. And that, that's really what we're talking about here, right? Getting healthy. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? And by the way, you, you know, this is something that is never ending. Yeah. Nobody wakes up. Nobody wakes up and, and crosses goes, hey, the finish line. I, yeah, this is the day, I guess. I can check it off my to-do list. I'm completely whole. Uh -huh. I, I have reached ultimate well-being. Yeah, right? wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody does that. We're all in process. And, and Leslie and I, we wrote this book together. We begin this kind of three-stage process by emphasizing what we call your profound significance. This is where it starts, profound mm. significance. Uh, it's the platform uh, upon which um, a sense of identity and, and well-being uh, really has to, to begin that uh, you are a person of worth, that you are loved as if you're the only person on the planet to love, as St. Augustine said. And uh, when you feel that deep down in your bones, you have a launching pad, you have a, a foundation that you can begin to do the other things that we talk about in this book. And and that's where a lot of us get struggled because we grew up in a shame-based home or, or uh, there was a lot of guilt, um, maybe irrational guilt and, and, and blame and, and so forth. And so to get this message that you are a significant, you are profoundly significant, right? How do we do that? Well, my suggestion is that you tune into the single most important conversation that you'll ever have. And you had it yesterday. <laughs> and you're having it tomorrow. And in fact, you're having it right now, even while you're listening to us, because this conversation never turns off. It's 24-7. It even happens while you sleep. It's your internal dialogue. It's your self-talk. And um, most of us don't give much thought to that at all. You know, we psychologists are fond of saying awareness is curative. Uh, you can't do anything in a proactive way until you become aware of it. I can say to my 16 year old son, hey, Jackson, it looks like your bedroom's really a mess in here. And he'll look around and go, oh yeah, I guess it is. Maybe I'll do something about that, <laughs> right? And then not until you have the awareness can you begin to take action. And so this is where it begins is, is tuning into this important self-talk, this important conversation. Imagine if before you fell asleep tonight, you could take a little computer chip out of the back of your head can you imagine? And you could slip it into your, your laptop and it would tabulate your internal dialogue for the previous 24 hours. Can you imagine if you could do that? And it would put it into one of two buckets, either positive self-talk or negative self-talk. Which one of those buckets would be full, most full for you at the end of any given 24-hour period, right? That's, that's an interesting question. If you're like most people, it might surprise you to learn that on average, 73% of your self-talk would fall into that negative bucket. Wow. Yeah. And we know this from research at UCLA, by the way. Yeah. And it's so but, sad to when you, I mean, when you hear that number outright. It's just, wow. Yeah. It is challenging. And, and by the way, uh, just today I was reading a study um, in the midst of all of our COVID craziness and lockdowns and everything mm -hmm. else, that uh, only 18% of couples that are in lockdown together, only 18% are satisfied with how they're communicating with each other. Wow. So even on the outside, we're not, not feeling great about how we're communicating, let alone on the inside. 
But that's what uh, I'm suggesting is that you tune into this important conversation. And by the way, before I forget, you can get a pretty good barometer reading on your internal dialogue by going to our website for this book. It's the book's title, HealthyMeHealthyUs.com. And just go there and uh, answer a few questions. It takes you less than five minutes. And it'll give you a, a nice little uh, kind of readout on how you're doing when it comes to your self-talk. But that's at HealthyMeHealthyUs.com. That's one of the things that I love so much about the book is with the resources that you've put on the website. And even in the in the book, I mean, you have you know, different questionnaires and things like that for really evaluating your self-talk. You have that self-talk test in there. Yeah, it's that that idea of, okay, you know, the 73%, the definitely more negative. How do you, how do you train your brain to undo that? How, is it, you know, you were saying the awareness, so starting with, um, you know, an assessment like this or just jotting some things down, some journaling, um, but then how do you try to change it? Yeah, and, and that's, uh, of course, what uh, we have a whole chapter in the book that is, is dedicated to doing just that. How do you change your negative self-talk? Because that's what uh, messes us up. Um, we spend 70% of our waking hours communicating in one form of, or another. And so, um, and, and if, and that's external communication, you know, whether it's email or what have you. And, uh, but, but this is going on all the time. This, that's why I say it's the single most important conversation. But when you tune into your self-talk, that awareness is almost enough to begin to create the change, to bring about positive change for you. Because like I said, awareness is, is really a great part of the cure. And so that's where we begin. I think that I'm looking at, uh, at, the, at the book right now and I'm tempted to give so many of these quotes that I highlight on, on self-talk because there's so much wisdom around this. Scott Peck was the hottest thing out there when it came to self-help and reading. He wrote a book called, and this was a long time ago, uh, wrote a book called The Road Less Traveled. And at the, at the, at the time, it was the single best-selling um, nonfiction book for uh, like three years running or something like that. And uh, it was notorious for, um, for having the very first sentence in the book say, life is difficult. And once you accept that fact life doesn't become as difficult is the sentiment of it. But anyway, he, he has this little quote here. I'm just going to, it's very short. He says, until you value yourself, you won't value your time until you value your time. You will not do anything with it. And that's what happens. We get stuck in this rut when we have negative self-talk. And you know, let me give you just a practical example of it in the midst of, of this worldwide pandemic, because I've just encountered so many people when I'm doing Zoom sessions and so forth. It just feels like they're waiting for the world to change, right? It's just like one day stacked on top of the next. And and when life gets back to normal, you know, I'll get out of my pajamas and I'll get a haircut and, and move on. Of course, you know, why would you put life on hold? Why would you not want to come out of this experience being a better person? and using that time that he's talking about and doing something proactive about it. So anyway, when it comes to changing your self-talk, I say become aware, take that little little questionnaire that's for free on at healthymehealthyus.com and uh, it will kind of show you how you're doing on that and give you some tailored uh, suggestions specific to where you're landing on it. You're listening to OTC episode 40 with Dr. Les Parrott, author of Healthy Me, Healthy Us. We'll be right back after a brief word from our sponsor. Would you like to talk to a counselor but can't find the time? Would you rather talk to someone from the comfort of your own home? If so, Parenting and Family Solutions is here to help. We now offer teletherapy to all clients who reside in the state of Pennsylvania. Using our secure portal, you can have a video session with your counselor using a laptop, desktop computer, or smartphone. Visit our website to learn more at www.parentfamilysolutions.com or give us a call at 717-602-5560 to see if teletherapy might be a good fit for you. 
Let us help you build a stronger family and a healthier you. It made me think of the Gottman Institute uh, talks about their their four horsemen and uh, the connection in in a relationship. Typically, they say the contempt is the the most damaging of those four horsemen. And when you think about that in relation to ourselves, just that negative self talk, the contempt for ourselves is going to weigh us down so much and just have such a repetitive negative impact on us. I had uh, I had lunch with John uh, a while back. And, and we were talking about, you know, marriage research stuff. And, and he's done more yeoman work than anybody on the planet when it comes to conflict and marriage. And, um, uh, of course, he's, he's kind of retired from the University of Washington. But he has done such incredible work. And I brought up that topic that you just mentioned, contempt. <laughs> he said something I'll never forget. He said, I wish we could pass laws in Congress against contempt in our relationships. It's like pouring poison on your love life. And by the way, you don't even have to use words to be contemptuous. You can just roll your eyes at somebody, you know? And so it, is, it really is, and you can do the same thing to yourself. And, and that's why guilt, um, in fact, I did my doctoral dissertation on the emotion of guilt and, and showed from a scientific perspective how guilt keeps us from loving other people. It's a selfish emotion. When we punish ourselves with guilt, what we end up doing it's like you're wearing mirrored sunglasses, you know, uh, but you flip the lenses around and you look out at the world and all you see is your own neediness. And you can't, you can't accurately see somebody else's needs, you know, when you're, when you're focused on your own, obviously. And it's kind of like if you have an a adolescent in your home, like we do, you know that the number one developmental task of every teenager on the planet across cultures is to answer one question. And that question is, who am I? Mm -hmm. Right? Where do I fit? It's all about identity. Yes. And, you know, you don't have to be 13 or 15 to be asking that question because there's plenty of adults that get stuck in that mode. And we walk into a, a room of other people and we say, how am I doing? What do you guys think of me? Right? Mm -hmm. And only when we mature, when we become healthy, do we begin to walk into that same setting and go, not how am I doing, but how are you doing? And we really mean it, not just because it's appropriate, but we really mean it, you know, and, and that's really where this book will take you and, and we'll get to that. But it all starts with with profound significance and tuning into your self-talk. As you were talking about the uh, developmental stages, it made me think of Maslow's hierarchy and that idea of like how many of us got stuck. Yeah. At that, you know, those social aspects, the belonging yeah. and identity, and then the, the love and affirmation. And yeah, right. Okay. I had lunch with Abraham Maslow last week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, man, you're making me, <laughs> making me so jealous. Wow. <laughs> no, what an incredible. Uh, uh, I think that, that when I was an undergrad, I think that was the first theoretical construct that I studied was the Maslow's hierarchy. And I learned about it because it was used in an ad for Apple computers. And uh, it's part of what intrigued me about the whole science of psychology. So um, it's still still a, a theory that holds water for sure. Definitely. You talk in the book about, you know, blind spots and, um, you know, that I, that idea of the unswerving authenticity. I think that's yeah. so needed, but obviously so hard for people to really take an honest look at, okay, what are my my areas? What are the the things that maybe I am not so great in? Well, it, it's true. The the whole idea, and, and that's this is the big this is the second big leap. The first is profound significance, and the next one is what we call unswerving authenticity. And this has to do with being true to you. All right, uh, this has to do with. Uh, um, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody come into my counseling office struggling with that proverbial disease to please. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. And there, there's there's folks that just walk around on the planet saying, man, if I could just accomplish this goal, 
maybe I'd get accepted into this group. If I if I chose this for my career, maybe mom and dad would give me their blessing. If uh, if I um, you know uh, behaved in this way, maybe so and so would smile in my direction. And, and we we can um, if we're not careful, we can walk around uh, just trying to gain that sense of approval, which kind of sounds loving on the surface of it, but it's not at all, right? It, there's no authenticity to it. It's the chameleon effect. But that proverbial disease to please um, is just the opposite of unswerving authenticity. Because unswerving authenticity says, in spite of what anybody else says, in spite of what anybody else thinks, in spite of what anybody might whisper behind my back, I know this is the pathway I need to go down um, for my career for my love life, for whatever. And I know, and in, in my worldview, uh, I, I say it, I need to go down the pathway that God is calling me to travel in spite of what anybody else thinks. And uh, and you can get criticized for that. In fact, it's guaranteed almost. You will get criticized for that. But you know that this is my conviction. This is what I've got to do. I remember uh, some time ago, uh, I was at our publishers, um, you know, Zondervan Publishing House division of, of Harper Collins. And, you know, since Leslie and I have written a few books, it was, uh, just their friends, our editors and everybody in the publisher. And so we went out to, uh, after the meetings, we went out for Chinese food and, and the table was buzzing about, and there's maybe six or seven people at the table and it's just buzzing about this new book that the publisher had just released that was getting incredible reviews and incredible response. And they couldn't print these things fast enough. And, and they were all just, you know, a buzz about this. And, and I said, well, what's the title of the book? And, uh, the, the publisher, the guy that heads up the whole house, everybody got quiet. They're like, tell him. And he says, well, it's called the purpose driven life. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we didn't know it sitting around that table, but that would go on to quickly become, uh, certainly one of the best selling books of all time. And with Rick Warren, anyway, I, I said, man, uh, and at the time I didn't know Rick Warren. And I said, uh, I don't know what the book is, is, uh, in, in the pages, but I, I kind of just got a whole message right there on the cover with the title, the, who doesn't want a purpose driven life, right? And that's really what unswerving authenticity is about. It's about knowing your purpose. Why on earth am I here? What am I all about? Mm -hmm. Where do my passions take me? And in spite of what anybody else says, this is what I, I've got to do. And so a, a healthy person has a lock on that. Does that make sense? They have a lock on their profound significance, mm -hmm. you know, that they're loved deep down in the core. They're a worthwhile person in spite of what anybody has said to them. And they're going to travel the path that God has called them to travel in spite of what anybody else might say too. Hmm. And, uh, and off of that, uh, you know, anybody listening, I would say even just writing those two things down that, that you just said last that, you know, I have value, I matter, you know, some of those, those core I statements, just writing those down for some people, they, they can't even say it out loud or write it. Uh, it's so just foreign to them a lot of times, but then seeing what comes after that if you you know writing those down and and starting to really think about yeah what what is that unswerving authenticity what is my path yeah it's true and in in that section you know we we put in two chapters for each one of these these big points that we're talking about you know obviously under profound significance we talk about uh self-talk uh we also talk about moving past your past because that can hold you down but under unswerving authenticity we talk about uncovering your blind spots and all of us uh, have things in our life that other people are aware of that we aren't. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, if you don't believe me, just uh, live in a home with uh, a couple of teenagers. Because they'll pull it out, right? Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> lovingly. Lovingly, of course. <laughs> right. But we all have them. There's, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of this thing called the Johari window. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. And we didn't, we didn't talk about that in this book, but it's such a good model for understanding there's things that we know about ourselves mm -hmm. and other people know about us. That's kind of the open window. Um, and then there's stuff that we know about ourselves 
that nobody else knows. Those That's the secretive window, right? And professionals will say you're only as healthy as the secrets you confess or something to that effect. Hmm. Uh, we, we don't want to keep a lot of secrets from people sure. because it's, it's akin to, I often think of it as like having a fully inflated basketball and you're in a swimming pool and you have to hold that basketball under the water mm. all day. The secret, that, sure. That's going to take a lot of energy to hold that thing under there because all it wants to do is is get up to the surface. And, and the same thing happens with our, our secrets. And then we have uh, a quadrant where it's known to uh, other people um, and, uh, and it's uh, not known to us. And those are your blind spots. And again, it comes down to awareness. We want to move beyond that and, and invite someone into our life. I've done this on numerous occasions and it's, it's a little bit painful. It's a little bit, you got to have some courage. It's a little bit scary, mm-hmm. but invite somebody into your life to go, Hey, I want you to help me see things that other people see in me that I don't see. And uh, you'd be surprised at how quickly some people will go, I'll do that for you. <laughs> yeah. um, it's the uh, three, 360 degree feedback. You better, better be careful what you're asking for. Exactly. I have a friend in, in Boulder, Colorado, and, and I didn't really ask him, but we're good friends and, and <laughs> in a meeting. And he said, can I give you some feedback in front of everybody else that's here? Oof. And I was like, uh, and we were all, you know, we all know each other pretty Depends well. Feedback. <laughs> and, he, and he gave me some feedback, and I was like, whoa, that's, that was risky to do there, Scott, but I, I hear it. And uh, his feedback was I was too focused on myself and what we were trying to negotiate together in, in some business stuff. Wow. And he was, he was right. And I had to step back and go, yep, okay, I get it. I get how this is coming off. And I, I welcome that. I actually thrive on it now these hmm. days. I've done it so, so much. And part of that might be because when you go to graduate school to become a psychologist, one of the things you mm-hmm. will inevitably end up doing is getting into a, a, a room with, you know, one of your first patients and being behind a mirrored uh, glass mm-hmm. where there's three other psychologists and they have what they call a bug in the ear. And they're saying, hey, are you aware that your foot is moving up and down? It looks like you're really anxious. You need to stop doing that. You know, <laughs> you start to get <laughs> feedback and you're leaning forward way too much. You look awkward, you know, that kind of stuff. And so those blind spots, if you want to get a lock on unswerving authenticity, being true to you, that's a good step forward is to be aware of those and blind spots. for anybody, uh, the Johari window, my understanding of the spelling is the J-O-H-A-R-I. So, yeah, if you just Google that, you'll see the diagram come up. Yeah, it's it's a great exercise to, to really take a look at. Yeah, yeah what, what are those things? Taking a step into some of that, I mean, you you have that Yada assessment, you know, connected to to the book and your your websites. And can you tell a little bit about what is that and what's that designed to do? Yeah, sure. And um, and, and just so we don't leave people hanging after profound significance and unswerving authenticity, the third big step. And, and if there's time, maybe we can touch on it too. But it's ultimately all about self giving love, right? And sending your own boundaries and recognizing other people's needs. Oh, I was I was just going to leave the cliffhanger for them to go get the book. I didn't want to give all three. <laughs> yeah, man, I appreciate that. It's going to cause so much anxiety, and we don't need that much anxiety right now. <laughs> yeah, Especially for anybody out there that uh, is like me and leans into OCD, it's like, what's the third one? <laughs> yeah, I had a list. <laughs> but yeah, so I appreciate you asking about the Yada assessment. I'm a, a big believer in taking assessments, taking inventory. It really does two things in our life. It increases awareness, which we've talked a lot about here. And then uh, secondly, it deepens our capacity for empathy. And that's another way of saying it. It improves our, our social IQ, right? Our relationship mm-hmm. IQ. Uh, just become more adept in interacting with people uh, because we can put ourselves in their shoes and see the world from their perspective. Yada. So yada is an ancient word. In fact, it's been used uh, more than a thousand times in scripture in the Old Testament, yada, it means to know. And it's to know with a a profound sense of knowing. It's to know with your head and your heart. It's not just an intellectual knowing, but it's a sense of resonance to know very deeply. And that's why you hear the Yiddish phrase, yada, 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 you know, you know, you know, which of course Seinfeld made famous. But uh, Uh this yada assessment is all about knowing you, yourself, knowing other people, and letting other people know you. So actually, it 
fits in perfectly with what we were just talking about with the Johari window. Um, and so yada, yada, yada. How's it work? Well, you go online and uh, it's a great accompaniment to this book. It's featured in the book, Healthy Me, Healthy Us. But you can go online to yada.com, Y-A-D-A. You take a little assessment. Uh, it takes you less than about 10 minutes or so. John, did you happen to take this, by the way? I, I don't know, yeah, I, I, yeah, I did have a chance to. Oh, good. So we can talk a little bit about that. But you take a, a, a series of questions, you answer those, and instantly it provides you this little PDF report on you, a Yada report. And it looks at things like your personality, the DNA of who you are, how you're made up. Are you uh, task-oriented or people-oriented? Uh, when it comes to problem solving, are you urgent or reflective and all kinds of interesting things. And it's very sophisticated. Um, and so, in fact, let me ask you, John, on the first page of Yada personality, it has those that personality ring. And if people, uh, you know, are envisioning it in their mind, it's like a, a pinwheel with eight little pedals. Uh, and it has like the achieving person, the pioneering, the energizing, the affirming. I am fast paced and task oriented. Which one of those are you? I'm deliberating. That's what I am. Oh, deliberating. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Okay. So you are, you're relative to other people, you're slower paced. In other words, you're going to take your time and do things right, you know, rather than fast. You're right on the midline between task oriented and people oriented. So a lot of scientists would be in this category, you know, and people that really need to make sure they're going to do the right thing the right way. You're going to tend to be pretty devoted in your relationships and accurate, pretty disciplined. Do you resonate with that? I definitely, yeah, disciplined and wanting to connect. It talks about, you know, the fight type, the time style, so much good information that, that came out of it. And that's just off the, the snapshot of it. Oh, yeah. So that's so I'm, I'm glad you, you found that. So we have what we call the Yada snapshot that gives you a one page summary of all the most important things about you. And we did that primarily for college students uh, because universities will sometimes use this as part of their freshman orientation or uh, classes and so forth. And then in the residence hall, they put up that Yada snapshot on their residence hall door and it just makes connecting with a person so easy because you instantly know some cool things about them. Yeah. And I, that was one of the things I had seen that done with the, the disc profile, uh, in some work environments while, where they'll print that out and have that on the door. And with the Yada, it talks about, you know, when talking to me, right. you know, do this, you know, prepare in advance, do your homework, follow through on what you say, you know, talks about my strengths and, and so, yeah, I could see where that would be really beneficial, especially for, for college students and uh, residence life and things like that. Yeah. Well, you got it. You get a little snapshot of that, and it's easy to share that with other people. And that's where this whole idea of being known by someone else, by other people. Uh, but that's why uh, we just felt like we wanted to include it and tie it into the message of Healthy Me, Healthy Us, because the whole Yada assessment is designed to help you highlight. And, you know, we were talking about self-talk. It shows you, you know, what are your strengths and in, in profound significance? It shows you the strengths that you bring into relationships. So if you've grown up in a home where you didn't get much affirmation, you don't really know what mm. your strengths are. You're going to learn about those in this in this assessment. And um, you're going to learn how you influence each other. You know, do, are you more influenced by facts or feelings? Are you uh, when you make decisions? By the way, on uh, page two of your report, it talks about how you make decisions there at the bottom. Are you a spontaneous decision maker or a cautious decision maker? Have you seen that? Uh, it looks like I'm more cautious. Yeah, more cautious. Yeah, and I'm spontaneous. So I, you know, uh, I remember Leslie and I were uh, driving. You know, I I don't want to drive the same way home when we used to be out in our cars all the time, uh, okay. going to work. Uh, well, why 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 live the same day twice? You know, I want to be yeah. spontaneous and and do, and Leslie, there's a sense of comfort that's found in the groove. You know, that uh, mm -hmm. a cautious decision maker. And so anyway, you become aware of those kinds of things in yourself. You become aware of those in the the kinds in the people that you interact with. It can go a long way to helping you. Be build healthier relationships. And that's why we call it Yada. Well, and I could see also, you know, beyond we were talking about the college application of like a couple sitting down to do this, uh, uh, being a, of huge benefit of, you know, 
really looking at, well, this is, you know, it says I tend more towards this and I, I resonate with that and what's yours and, and being able to go back and forth and really talk about that as a, as a positive, uh, you know, connecting activity. It's super fun. And in fact, I'll let our listeners in on um, a little insight here. If they are, uh, you know, in a, in a couple, if your partner is willing to, you know, go through this with you, uh, take the better love assessment because that's a couple's version of Yada. Um, and uh, it'll it'll do something that no other assessment in the world does, as far as I know, and that is it'll combine your two results. So it shows you, like on that personality pinwheel, where each of you land, and it's all infographic driven. You know, it's it's mm-hmm. fun. This is not there's no shame or blame. It's not a rush and, act. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's true. Um, and um, so you'll you'll find where you land, and then it, it talks about. Oh, okay. So now, you know, you're pioneering and she's unwavering or, or cooperative or affirming or whatever the case may be. And then what happens when the two of you get together? And it's not like, it's not like we're just kind of combining paragraphs. We have 40,000 variables that go into each one of these paragraphs. So you won't see that on anybody else's report. That is specific to you and nobody else. So even if you both land on the same, you know, let's say you're both energizing spouses or something like that, um, you would have distinct paragraphs. And there's a lot of levers and pulleys behind the scenes. So this is kind of simplicity on the other side of complexity, if that makes sense. Yeah. And just from a assessment standpoint, I mean, that, like you said, uh, no other in the world. I mean, that that's um, that a lot goes into that, obviously. Well, our development team, our coders uh, have had a lot of uh, late nights. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. But that's uh, like you said, I mean, just the the huge thirst for that, for knowledge and healthy relationships and happy relationships and um so it's obviously it's a huge need. So that's that's so amazing that you all have been able to to put this together. Oh, thanks. Um, I appreciate that. We're we're passionate about it, and we've spent our whole professional lives doing it. And um, it all really was born out of this where we started at the very beginning of this interview. It was born out of uh, seeing a need that nobody was meeting for university students, and it's been uh, a wonderful thing to see so many people. In fact, I just got news from our publisher that. Uh, um, we have um, more than 5 million folks that have gone through saving your marriage before it starts at this point. So it's pretty incredible. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I had a guest on recently, uh, Aaron Potratz, who uh, he was a student of yours at Seattle Pacific. And he was saying, you know, he's gotten the training in Symbus and uses it all the time. Um, so, yeah, can you kind of just highlight what, what is the Symbus assessment. Yeah. I hope he passed my courses, by the way. I, I believe he did. He is now a therapist. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. Uh, well, the Symbus assessment, you know, as I mentioned, we wrote this book, Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts, and uh, we have updated it uh, twice because we want to keep it uh, fresh with the latest, uh, you know, research. And, um, And then we thought a few years ago, why are we not taking the same um, leverage that we kind of built at eHarmony um, to do this for these couples? And so we we uh, built the the, uh, Symbis assessment, S-Y-M-B-I-S, that's saving your marriage before it starts. And so that is specifically for facilitators, you know, counselors and therapists and chaplains and pastors and coaches and mentors to get trained and certified. They do that online, takes about three hours, and then they can invite a couple to take the assessment on their Symbus dashboard and then debrief that report with them. And so it's kind of a much more in-depth version of the one I just mentioned, the, the Better Love Assessment. And uh, requires a, a a bit of a more uh, clinical interpretation for people. They can't just do that one on their own. But uh, but yeah, if you want to find a Symbus facilitator, just go to Symbus.com and you can enter your uh, zip code, and um, and you'll see people right there in your neighborhood that are probably trained and certified in it. Mm. 
Yeah, and it's it's such an awesome resource to be able to to use that search tool and find somebody uh, because I think a lot of times, um, yeah, especially with premarital counseling and, and people preparing for a wedding, I, I always love, well, don't love, uh, the, the stat that I've heard is, you know, in today's America, we spend about average of like 35000 on a wedding. And if you think about how much time, money, and effort did you spend preparing for the marriage as opposed to the wedding, um, and that's everything that Symbus is supposed to do is help you with that. Yeah, that's the whole the whole goal is marry right, you know, uh, get a, a great launching pad for lifelong love. And uh, there's no excuse for not doing that really these days because the research is so um, blatant. Uh, again, a mountain of research to stand on there. We know as a professional community what it takes to enjoy lifelong love. So why in the world wouldn't you want to take advantage of that? In fact, we also know from research, independent research, that um, when you go through the Symbus assessment with a facilitator, you lower your chances of divorce by at least 31 percent. And not only that, you increase your level of contentment and satisfaction and happiness by at least 30 percent. So it helps you steer away from the rocks and it helps you uh, enjoy more sunny days. Who doesn't want that? Wow. Yeah, I wasn't aware of those those percentages. That's amazing. Mm. And so to kind of zoom way out, um, you're, you know, obviously there are listeners that um, they have they are they're married already. Uh, they have kids. Any advice for how to help their children um, avoid some of these pitfalls or to have have good self-talk or things like that? Well, the the answer is going to sound flippant, but the most important thing you can do for your kids is model a great marriage yourself. And it, it kind of goes akin to healthy me, healthy us, right? Um, you want your kids to marry well. You show them what a great marriage looks like. Um, the vast majority of college students these days, when you ask in a, just a random room, how many of you came from a home where uh, the marriage you witnessed is not something that you would want? the majority of hands will go up. Uh, and then those hands that do go up on, yeah, I'd love to have a marriage just like my mom and dad had. Those those students aspire to that and uh, they, they have a good model to go on. So that's that's the advice there. Oh, that's so well said. And then thank you. Thank you for sharing of your, your wisdom and uh, your experience. I, I can't thank you enough for being willing to be on the show. So any any parting wisdom if you were speaking to every couple you know in the world or across the country well yeah anything you'd give them get yourself healthy <laughs> that's the message get yourself emotionally relationally spiritually healthy um because that's the the most important thing you can do for your relationships and that includes not just your marriage but your friendships and and uh, any other relationships that are of value to you as well. So, John, thanks for having me on the on the podcast. I appreciate it, and uh, I, you asked such great questions, and and hopefully this has been of value to your listeners. But it's really an honor to be with you today. Thank you so much. Yeah, I hope it is helpful to the listeners. But I've gotten so much out of it. Thank you. Take care. And there you have it, OTC listeners. Thank you, as always, for stopping by and checking out another episode. Uh, I'm, I'm really so appreciative to the listeners, uh, the people that follow along on Facebook and Instagram and, and supply questions and um, you know comment on things. I, I, this show wouldn't be possible without you all, so I, I really am indebted to you. Um, with this book, Healthy Me, Healthy Us, do yourselves a favor. Uh, chances are either you need the book or somebody you know needs the book. And and I would definitely recommend stopping by the Parrot's website at lessandlesley.com. So that's L-E-S and L-E-S-L-I-E dot com. Uh, there you should be able to get to any of their books as well as the multiple assessment tools that they've created. Um, like I said, pass the information on. Uh, healthy relationships are just so vital to our society, and it's obviously something that we all want. So uh, like I said, there, there's definitely a need for it. Thank you all for stopping by, and I'll catch you all next episode.
If you liked what you heard, be sure to subscribe and review wherever you're catching this podcast at. You can check out detailed show notes and archived episodes at www.pfsonthecouch.com. If you want to stay up to date on future guests and contribute questions, be sure to follow us on your favorite social media platforms. The author and host of this podcast is not engaged in a therapeutic relationship with the listener and cannot give counseling advice without a confidential appointment. Listeners should be sure to consult with a licensed therapist in their area or seek emergency medical attention if they are experiencing psychological difficulty. A special thanks to the band The Topsy Turvies for the show theme song. Their song, Like a Living Dead, can be found at topsyturvies.bandcamp.com. The bump interview track was the song 1973 by Bruno E. The author and host of this podcast is John Dennis. Special thanks to editor and show producer Trevor Groff.